the Real Women Real Purpose talk show live on the On Purpose Woman Magazine Facebook page. I'm Jenny Robertson, one of the hosts of the Real Women Real Purpose talk show, and I'm also the founder and publisher of On Purpose Woman Magazine and founder of the On Purpose Woman Global Community. I'm here today with community artist and art educator, Sarah Kaltwaster. Hey, Sarah, thanks for being here. I'll be talking with Sarah about art as self-care. Uh, Sarah, before we dive into your topic, I want to tell our viewers a little bit about you. So Sarah Kaltwasser is a multidisciplinary artist and community art educator with over 15 years of experience. Sarah has shown in galleries and art venues across the United States and is a two-time Sondheim Art Prize semifinalist. Currently, she is an artist in residence at the Wise and Well Center for Healthy Living, a holistic health center focused on the care and health of older adults. Her efforts and programming at the center work towards the creation and implementation of inclusive art curriculums that technically and conceptually engage participants. Sarah also coordinates the curatorial programming at Keswick, which seeks to connect Keswick community members with the broader Baltimore art community. So Sarah, you've got all kinds of just vast experience and talents. So there's so much we could talk about, but I think I'd like to begin with your journey with art. When and where did it start? Um, it started as early as I can remember. Um, I was always a creative kid. I always really loved to draw and paint. I was the kid in kindergarten where the teacher would say, you can take three pieces of paper and I would like mischievously like go back and like take half the ream from the stack and like hide it in my desk and draw little comics on it. Like I was, I was that kid, even when I was interested in other professions, like for a minute, I wanted to be a veterinarian. I wouldn't, you know, take care of the animals or pets in our house. I would draw pictures of me enacting this veterinary profession. So art has always been kind of an integral co component of my life, but I didn't start really thinking like, oh, I can do this as a profession until I got a little bit older, started learning more about it and then kind of seeing what the opportunities were. So were you in like high school when that started or? Were you yeah, like school? late middle school, early high school. I think once you have an art teacher for the first time, that kind of opens a door, you know, yeah. because they're, they're telling you all the things that you could do and you can also see it enacted in class every day. So mm -hmm. um, that, that, that was a way to kind of open up the possibility of like, oh, it's not just like making art, you can teach art, you can design things, you can plan art shows, like all of a sudden there was this kind of like world of possibility. <laughs> yeah. Wow, and you get to do a little bit of all of that, don't you, at Keswick at the Wise and Well Center? Oh, most definitely, for sure. Yeah. We'll talk more about what you do there a little bit later. So did you get much encouragement from like family members? Because, you know, often when somebody says, well, I'm gonna major in art, all you hear is, well, nobody makes a living majoring in art, or nobody makes a living as an artist, which is simply not true but a lot of people, it's a nice catchphrase, isn't it? Right, I, I think like, I, I, I was really lucky and blessed to have a, a family that was really encouraging. Um, my parents um, were always supportive and like taking me to like art, art programs, art classes, or, you know, supporting me when I was like, oh, that set of markers, that's, I need that. Oh, yeah. um, you know, so it wasn't like, well, you're not gonna make a living at this, so you can't have it. It was more just kind of like, I think what they did do for me, which was really wonderful though, is like, like make a plan, you know, make okay. a plan about what you wanna do with your art. How do you wanna do it with your art? Where do you wanna go make set goals, you know? Um, okay. Like, so in that way, you know, it was, it was, there was never a lack of support. There was always an encouragement about a uh, realistic plan and expectations to make the things that you wanna have happen happen. That's really great. So if you're going, if you're serious about this, then let's be serious about this. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I know that you believe that art is a means of creative play, self-care and expression. And we're gonna be talking about the self-care piece today. And I understand creative play and expression as part of art, but I've never heard anyone actually compare or say that, well, I guess associate art with self-care. Talk about that some. So, you know, I think a lot of times when we think about things like self-care, it can go into what we think of like as traditional kind of wellness kind of like zones, mm -hmm. but there are so many aspects to wellness. Um, we know that from the domains of wellness that there's things like financial wellness or spiritual wellness, um, physical wellness, um, occupational wellness, and 
And so art has the capacity to kind of fit in these multiple domains um, as, a, as a kind of wellness feature. Um, but it also just, you know, art, making art feels good. Learning about art sparks curiosity. Um, it, it helps you, art is a way to like engage in the world in many different ways. And so in that way, it can be this tool for self-care because it can help you examine different ideas or um, uh, explore something that maybe you were hesitant about exploring. So it's, you know, art serves a lot of, a lot of things in the interest of the person enacting it, right? Mm -hmm. so, and that way, I think it can be self-care for sure. Okay. And when I think about it, it's it, art can be very self-indulgent, can't it? In a really good way. Yeah. And so I think self-indulgence is a form of self-care. Oh, absolutely. You know, making time for myself, doing something that, that floats my boat, if you will, that brings me joy. So yeah. all of those things can be found in art. Oh, 100%. 100 like art, um, art feels good. Like yeah. it yeah. scratches the parts of our brains that um, you know, make us focus in or um, give us that little kick of, you know, that happy chemical in our brain. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it literally feels good when you, when you make it and you're enjoying it. So. And I guess it only feels good if we're not caught up on our results. Correct. Let's talk about the non-artist people, you know, the ones that sure. say like me, oh, I can't do, you know, I'm not an artist. I don't do art. And I, you know, I do some things that probably could be considered art if I wasn't such a self-critic about it, you know, but what do you say to people so that we can enjoy it and not see it as a comparison or, oh, you're going to be looking at how bad my stick figures are? Yeah. Um, so I think there's a couple ways to approach it. Um, I think there's multiple ways to engage with art. There's, you can listen to it, watch it, look at it, mm -hmm. um, talk about it. And so in that way, I think it is a lot, art is a lot more accessible. Um, there's, there's more than one way to, to be involved in the arts. Um, and, and for those people that want to make art, but tend to get pretty frustrated, I think it's about, um, you know, going back and kind of, you know, like whoever you're working with being like, Hey, this is, this is hard for me. Um, I, I, how can you help me or how can, how can we get the result that I want to get? And then working with someone to help you make that plan. It kind of goes back to that, that planning again. And, and, and knowing that you know art is a journey, there's not a there's not one singular correct end result in art making. There's lots of different answers to the question of what is art, and there's no right or wrong answer. It's just about kind of making something that sparks your interest, sparks your curiosity, sparks your joy, um, and is something that you want to make that excites you. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think a lot of us have been, especially women of a certain age. You know, we were we were kind of groomed to know what art is and what it isn't, mm -hmm. and so I, I love your approach to it because it's art is something whatever it is that I love doing, that right. can be artistic. Mm -hmm. you know, some people probably think you know they can do some magnificent stick figures and feel really good about it. You know, yeah. And so I I, I don't know if I've told you this story or not about my this stint I went through where I thought I was supposed to be like crafty. And I'm just really not. And the bottom line is I don't really enjoy it. So I don't, but I was wanting to put myself, I had married into this family and not only were these women in this family, I mean, they were also professional women, but they didn't just do like needlepoint. They had their home designed by an artist and had a canvas made and did the needlepoint. So I thought, well, I should be doing that stuff. And I would be just so confused. And the back of my needlework projects would look just be pieces of mangled thread. And I remember one day and I just would pile it into the closet and I would spend this money and not finish anything. And I remember one day I just said, I don't even like this. Why am I putting myself through this? And I threw all that stuff away. Mm -hmm. And it was like this huge weight had been lifted off of me because I had these expectations that right. their art was supposed to be my art. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, it doesn't make sense, but... <laughs> You know, but does it make sense? I mean, do you, do you find that out there that we just have to be almost reprogrammed? Our brains need to be opened more to the I possibilities? Think, I think we, you know, we hear a lot about, like, from an academic standpoint, especially, like, this is what fine art looks like. Yes. This is what good craft looks like. And um, I, I think that, uh, you know, reprogramming might, might be one word. I think another way to think <laughs> about it is, like, broadening. You know, like mm -hmm. broadening those definitions of of what constitutes fine art or um, what what art looks like. I you know some of the most I, you know you mentioned a thread project or a kind of a needlepoint project. Mm -hmm. 
I, there are lots of like portrait artists that work in needlepoint and the more interesting part of their work is the back. They may oh, do something wow. that's hyper-realistic on the front with this needlepoint, but then the thing that really, you know, like kind of checks the box for me visually that's interesting is the kind of assemblage of structure in the back. And so I think like, you know, one person may look at that piece of work and say, oh, the front's where it's at. That's all the technique and that's all the skill. And I'm like, the back is where it's at. The process of making that piece was the actual art. You know, so I think it's it's um, there's maybe reprogramming, but I think it's also just kind of like opening up the idea of what the definition of it can be and yeah. not feeling beholden to everybody's going to make something that looks different. Everybody's going to think that, you know, certain kinds of art or certain kinds of music or certain kind of film is kind of like the pinnacle um, and everybody has that different opinion. So I think it's OK to, you know, be like, hey, my stuff doesn't have to look like that other person's stuff. My, my stuff can look like mine. Yeah, and I'm OK with that. Yeah. I love this idea that you you think the back is where it's happening. I, I might have been making some great art and not even known it, right? Yeah, for sure. My backs might have been amazing. I do love that. And I could just tell by the way you talk about art and the way you you talk about um, the broadening that you you are probably so amazing as a teacher with people who don't who do have doubts about why am I even here trying to do this? Because I'm probably not going to be very good at it. But it, I think you can help with the broadening in a big way. Thank you. Yeah, I'll say more about that. Um, you know, I think that your horn for you a little bit. What? <laughs> While I toot your horn for you a little bit. Yeah, oh, I, I appreciate it. I think the broadening <laughs> is definitely, you know, part of my work uh, at Keswick and just as an artist. Like, um, I was trained as a community artist and a socially engaged, like social practice artist. And even though my background is in kind of like more formal traditions of, of painting and drawing originally, like what I came to kind of realize through my professional practice is that art is so powerful in making change and discussing things. And so this idea that you can like um, use art to um, kind of unpack the world in a new way mm -hmm. meant for me that everybody needs that opportunity, right? Um, and that, um, you know, as you know, high up on a pedestal literally is art and art objects can be like anybody can put something into a, a space and say, this is my art and let's talk about it. And so I, I want to make that, I want art to be accessible to everyone. I want people to be able to utilize it in whatever way they need to use it. That's really important to who I am as an artist and, a, and an educator. And so um, that's kind of central to the work that I do at Keswick and, and beyond. I, I do really love that. And I imagine that the more people we have living from that place and teaching from that place, the more children will also enjoy art as they're exposed to it and not feel like, you know, they have to fit within certain guidelines. You were probably never a color inside the line kind of girl, were you? When oh, you were definitely older. not. I, yeah. I was, I, let's just say I was very interested in abstraction very early. Mm. <laughs> I read a little story one time about a, a woman who was teaching, a, I think it was a class of first graders, and they, she'd given them these, you know, pre-printed pictures of trees, and they had to color the trees. And this little girl is coloring her tree this bright purple, and the teacher comes over and says, my child or young lady, um, there's no such thing as a purple tree. I've never seen a purple tree before. And little girl looks up and says, you haven't? Oh, I'm so sorry. And I thought, wow, if we, you know, because that stuff, it seems trivial at the time, but it can really glom onto us about the rules, especially about creativity, about the rules and how to follow them. And you, you always want to be neat and tidy. And you don't want to, at least that's the world I grew up in. It doesn't sound like that's the world you grew up in. So I love that we have to, you know, kind of shake that up. It's been yeah. shaken up. And I love that that's what you do. You're like a shaker upper kind of person. So um <laughs> I didn't know I was going to say that. That was kind of weird. Let's go back to talking about uh, the self-care piece or the health benefits. Because I know there are health, you believe there are health benefits. So can you talk about some of those? Yeah, so there's, there's definitely a variety of health benefits to just engaging with art in your life or making art. Um, first off, um, art is in some ways really rooted in problem solving and critical thinking. And so it's gonna engage your brain in a really active way, um, especially if you're learning new techniques that might be new to you. Um, that, that kind of hand-mind connection about learning the, the kind of rote motor skills that you need to enact that, that kind of technique repetitively 
um, that that's activating something. You're learning a new skill like riding a bike or um, doing needlepoint for the first time or printmaking, carving a block. All of those things, uh, you know, take practice. But once they're embedded, you've you've like trained yourself to do that kind of at a hand level and a mind level, and that's a really powerful thing at any age. Um, in terms of uh, what else what else art can do from a health standpoint, uh, just emotional health. Like art helps us put a visual language to things that may be difficult to talk about. Um, art can help us process our emotions or our feelings, especially during this time of pandemic. Um, it, it's a really powerful tool if, if you feel like you can't say the things that you need to say about your experience in words. Art has a way to bring joy into that moment or allow you to make um, space to examine that without having to talk it out all the time, right? Um, and just at a, like a base level, like um, art and memory are, are really powerful things. Like people have memories of, of that stay with them of like maybe the first concert that they went to or the first time they saw a particular painting. Um, what we know about um, uh, like brain health and memory and art is that um, like even as you as you're aging and certain memory kind of issues are coming into play, you know those aspects of recognizing beauty in the world, like processing and being able to say like I like that, that's beautiful to me, that stays mm -hmm. with you. And so you know we see it in social media and things like that too, where you know a, 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 maybe a former ballet dancer is listening to. A, a song from Swan Lake and they remember all the moves, even if they've been in the, um, you know, a memory care unit of a nursing home for a long time. So that art has the, the capacity to touch our lives at really interesting deep levels and stay with us and help us um, turn back on some of those things that maybe feel a little bit farther away from us from a memory standpoint than they, than they previously were. So those are just a few ways. <laughs> yeah, that's so interesting. And when you talk about learning something new, so in, in the in the, um, the doing of art or the creating of art of any sort, if it's something that you haven't done before, or like you say, you're learning a new technique, a new skill, you're also creating some new neural pathways, I would imagine, in your brain. So yeah, all, all kinds of good stuff there. Um, yeah. Just even like finer motor skills, like, yeah. those, like art, you can make broad gestures, like you may paint big. Those are, you're activating your whole body when you're painting big. Matisse, mm -hmm. Uh, used to put his paintbrush at the end of a pole and paint from like six feet away. That's, you can't make a mark tiny when you're painting from six feet away. You have to use your whole body. Um, but like even at a basic level like that, those finer motor skills of like doing a pointillist painting or drawing or um, doing like watercolor really methodically, um, the, you know, those, those finer motor skills are just as beneficial as the, as the bigger physical movements. And so it's engaging your body in a different way, dance, moving to music, all of those things connect to art. Well, tell us a little bit about what you do at the Wise and Well Center. How do you use your skills and your ability to broaden this whole topic of art and what is and isn't art and who is and isn't an artist? How do you use that there? Um, so we, we do it in a variety of ways. Um, at a base level, we, we've been offering uh, art classes for years. Um, and these art classes touch upon a variety of, of of ways of you know, utilizing art from art technique classes where people are learning a specific skill that maybe they're not familiar with or they've always wanted to try for the first time um, or maybe something they're coming back to, um, to um, classes that really unpack different ideas by utilizing a specific technique. Um, we also have art history classes or art dialogue classes. Um, we, we also do artist talks. So we're really interested in like connecting people where they want to meet us at in terms of their art engagement, you know. So, um, uh, like on a given day or a week at Keswick, you can take an art class um, where you're learning watercolor techniques to paint flowers. So you're learning those finer motor skills and and color mixing techniques. And then the next day, you can attend an art history class where we're talking about Van Gogh's The Potato Eaters in a class called the, A Deeper Look, where we critique a work of art and we're just kind of like you know, using, using our brains and using our ideas to kind of say what we see and what we think about it. Um, you know, later in the week, we'll have an artist talk and you get to talk to an artist and why do, you, why do you make it that way? Why do you do it this way? How did you do that technique? So it's really like opening up, um, uh, you know, demystifying art in a way. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes we can think like art is this inaccessible thing, which is why people think it has to look a certain way or feel a certain way. But you talk to an artist, you're gonna be like, oh yeah, I, you know, I, I trace that. 
or, oh, like I practiced this like a hundred times. I didn't get it right the first time, you know? And so it, by, by creating spaces to have conversations with artists who demystify those processes, and then all of a sudden it doesn't seem so complex and so difficult. And then it, it feels like it's achievable and possible. Yeah. Um, you know, so uh, the, we, we do a variety of things just in, on the class level. We also have a curatorial program, which you mentioned right at the beginning, where again, we're interested in connecting people with um, artists in the Baltimore and the DMV community. Like we wanna bring artists to Keswick, they bring dynamic things to our community. And um, so we have them show work, we connect our members and people that attend our classes with those artists. Um, we have uh, art exhibition space on the second floor um, where we're featuring artists multiple times a year and having artist talks and workshops related to that. Sometimes we'll have, um, like we had a fiber artist show last January and then we had um, them teach an indigo fiber dye class right after their mm -hmm. show opens. So we try and also scaffold it. So you're like, okay, you see what this artist has done, now learn this technique. So again, it goes back to that demystifying, but also like engaging the excitement, like, oh, I can make something that looks like that. Yeah, absolutely. You, you can definitely do that. It is possible. Yeah. So possibility is the order of the day. <laughs> what was that? I said possibility is the order of the day in the art. Oh, program. okay. Yes. Yeah. So you, you typically, um, the Wise and Well Center, you serve uh, those who are 50 plus, correct? Correct. Okay. Do you often get people in there uh, who, or do you, you get people in there who are like hesitant and mm -hmm. then you see them grow and blossom and just, that's probably one of the things you most love about what you do, I would imagine, seeing people shift their ideas about what they're capable of, what art looks like. Yeah, so proud about something that they did, get some joy in it. Oh, definitely. Um, I think that's one of the best parts of my job actually is, you know, uh, having someone join us who maybe never even thought about making art. Mm -hmm. um, maybe they start by attending one of our artist talks or artist lectures. Maybe they start attending our art history class where sometimes we'll talk about how a technique is enacted or how it's done. That'll, you know, tickle a part of their brain and they'll be like, oh, that's interesting. Okay, that's how they did it. Oh, I see that this class is coming up. And all of a sudden they've gone from being someone who's like, oh no, I don't think I could never make art. I've never made art. I'm not creative. I'm not artistic. And then, you know, down the line, maybe a year, maybe two years down the line with us, they're, you know, painting three foot by three foot paintings, oh, yeah. you know? So, um, or, you know, making a sculpture that they, you know, a few years ago, or even maybe even a few months ago, didn't think was possible to make, you know? Um, so uh, that, that journey, that process is like at the heart of what we do. And um, it's definitely one of the joys of the work I get to do here for sure. And I love seeing it, it's, it's awesome. I, I really like this whole idea of making art as opposed to being an artist, because mm -hmm. I think when you say making art, it, it, I even have visuals of sitting down with Play-Doh, you know what I mean? Just making art, you're, you're just making, it's like making bread, right. you're making something, you're creating something mm -hmm. that for me, making art means you're creating something you have no idea what the end result's gonna be yet mm -hmm. because you're making it. So right. You're not following this. I mean, you may be following techniques and things like that, but to me, it just opens it up and takes the stress out of it. Yeah, I think like, like any profession, like, like people, you know, when you say like, oh, I don't know if I'm an artist, I can't say that I'm an artist because a lot of people think that there's a lot of expertise tied into that. And there is, but that expertise, like any skill set is learned over time. And sometimes it's learned in formal ways, like going through art schools or going to art classes, but sometimes it's learned through lived experience. And so, or just trying something over and over again, you know, not every artist goes to art school um, or has shows in fancy spaces. Some of some of the best artists, you know, we don't learn about till later. And they, you know, they did their whole thing, you know, in their home because that just brought them joy and they just love doing it or they wanted to say something about the world in which they lived and that's how they did it. So, yeah, it's really cool. It's very cool. And I think the first time I started to actually change my thinking around that a little bit was when the Visionary Art Museum opened in Baltimore. Oh yeah, because I had never seen anything. Nobody had ever seen anything like that, probably, unless you maybe you were working in a, or you were in art school, or you were working in a community and doing that sort of thing, and you had, you know, people doing outsider art who didn't know they were artists, right? Until they were, until people told them they were, probably, or they were just they were just expressing things in their lives, 
And so that told me that, man, anything can be art. Yeah. You, know? yeah. you can decorate a car in hubcaps painted hubcaps and it can be art, you know? Yeah. So I think that's um, that's the fun side of art. You know, there's, there's the beauty side and there's just really the whimsical kind of fun side also that doesn't have to mean anything necessarily on a deeper level. It's just yeah. joy, pure joy. Yeah, so. I, think, I think too, like um, there's, a, there's, there's this joy, in, but in the long term, there, there is like this, I think that, the there's meaning in the joy right there's like yes. um there like uh, there are some people that have artwork at the visionary art, Mu art museum you know that we're exploring like there's a lot of like religious work right and so um you know the people exploring the kind of relationship with god or the universe and like mm -hmm. trying to unpack that and there's a joy in that but there's also kind of like this asking a question yeah. you know? and and so there's meaning in that too that um a lot of artists the process of making the work or the thing that incited the work is just as much as part of the work as the final product, you know? So it's, a, I, think, I think it's rooted in that as well. You're so brilliant. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let's see, so you're, you're an artist in residence there. Does that entail anything more than what you've told us about? What does that mean exactly? So as the artist in residence, I'm kind of like the uh, creator in in Keswick space. So what that means is that um, I'm helping with that curatorial program. I'm supervising all of our facilitating artists, making connections with the art community, um, trying to just really activate art in every sense of the word on Keswick's campus. Mm -hmm. um, we work with our clinical side to support the residents living in our adjacent nursing home space. So they get art engagement. Um, so um, it's really kind of like a all hands on deck situation. Oh, the lights went out. Do you mind if I turn them on? I don't, go ahead. Yeah, sorry about that. There we go. So I had a feeling it might happen and it did. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's, it's a, there's a lot of things that we do um, and that I do uh, as part of my work as an artist in residence, I wear a lot of hats, but um, they're all in the service of art in our community, so. That probably makes your, your job, if you will, so much more interesting than if you were just teaching one form or just, you know, it sounds like you have a lot of, of leeway there to create for the creative, you know, the um, like create the space, create the programs, you know, you come up with your own ideas about what you want to offer, I'm assuming, or right. yeah. So a lot of a lot of opportunity for you to express yourself through other yeah. people. Yeah. Uh, one one secret thing that a lot of people don't know about the arts is that artists are, you know, they're makers, but they're also um, in in cases where they teach or something that they're facilitators, they're event planners, they're sometimes DJs, they're sometimes <laughs> um, caterers. You know, the mm -hmm. an artist's job it touches so many aspects of um, kind of what needs to happen to make something happen right like yeah from budgeting for a big project or writing a grant to you know um just like planning an art engagement like at a curricular level it's all it's it's uh artists artists do a lot of things and so i get to exercise those muscles of doing a lot of different things at keswick mm -hmm. i'm glad you brought that up because you know for those of us on the outside looking in we just see the finished product sometimes yeah. thinks well that's all they do all day is just sit and paint you know and i'm sure some do but not 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 most people probably not most artists have the luxury of just sitting and painting all day or would they want to i don't know yeah i i mean i think i part of me is like oh i'd love to sit and paint all day yeah but i think because community and education is so much part of my work that it would find its way back in. I'd probably paint all day for like a month and then I'd be like, wait, I'm gonna teach a painting class or I'm gonna do this or I'm gonna do that. And um, and so uh, uh, I think, you know, some people can handle painting all day and having a studio practice. Some people gotta be out out in a different way and acting work, uh, artwork in a, different, in a different manifestation. Yeah. Are you all doing any online art programs now? Oh yes. Um, so that a little bit. So you don't have to be in the Baltimore area take nope. advantage of these programs, everyone. No, we have people taking classes with us from all around the country right now um, in our virtual program. We have people 
on the West Coast, uh, outside of Maryland, Philadelphia, Carolina, Seattle. Um, so uh, in that way, it's very, very cool. We had someone from Chicago last week. Um, we have a variety of classes. We just actually wrapped up a few technique focused classes with some of our teaching fellows um, who taught an entire year, um, some of it in person and some of it online. Um, we have uh, our art history programs, which are online. We'll do um, technique workshops online. Uh, as part of the pandemic, we had planned to, you know, um, eventually have an online presence as well as a in-person presence in terms of our art classes, but the pandemic kind of sped that process along for us. Um, but what, what it's done is really allowed us to understand in, a, in essentially a year how to offer quality online programming that kind of hits a bunch of different notes in terms of what people want for their art engagement. So um, uh, yeah, we're doing all sorts of stuff. We, got, we have um, a hybrid class coming up in the summer that's a sketchbook class. So each week people will get a prompt about what they wanna draw in a sketchbook that we provide to them in an art kit that we provide. And uh, then uh, our instructor will help them work through those techniques. So, you know. Um, so it's it's going to be really cool, and that's online, and you can take it in person at Keswick. So okay. we have the we have the technology, we have the the ability to do that. Yeah, that's that's what I've been seeing for the last year. Is one of the silver linings of the pandemic is some of us were were really put in a position where we could just, and I think the pivot word has been overused a bit, but we really did, you know, kind of seamlessly in some ways. But I know it took a takes a lot more to put on an, an art class than it does to do a a networking meeting like I was able to start doing right away. But it's still something that I don't know that I would have gotten around to doing that for some time down the road. And now I'm looking forward to continuing some of that and going back in person when things open up a little bit more. So if you're out there anywhere, wherever you are, you can take classes. And I would tell you that it is so inexpensive, that it's such value. And so I'm gonna put the link to the website in the uh, information about about our little chat here today so that everybody can go on and find out more about Sarah's programs at the Wise and Well Center in the Bowling Park area of Baltimore and online. So Sarah, is there anything else that you wanted to mention that we haven't touched on yet? I think we covered pretty much everything. I would encourage people to reach out to me um, if they have questions about classes at Keswick, um, online or in person or hybrid. Um, and also just kind of let us know what you're interested in. We're always, we're like the art program here and kind of what we try to do and what I try to do is really be responsive to what the community wants. So mm -hmm. um, if you're looking for a particular type of class, you know, it may not be on the schedule now, but it might be in a few months. So um, I would say communication is really important for us. And we just want to know what people want to do and we want to make that happen. Um, so, uh, and what people want to see and what people want to learn about. So. Um, I would say reach out to me, um, uh, and uh, you can also, um, you know, check out uh, all of our information on our Instagram and on our website and about upcoming classes. So, um, yeah, uh, yeah, that's it. Okay, what's it? Is it Wise and Well Center on Instagram? Uh, Keswick Wise and Well. Keswick Wise and Well. Okay. So I think this is so great for on so many levels because you know I'm feeling a little re-inspired myself or maybe inspired initially. <laughs> to actually do something like that. I, I really want to, uh, just to see, just to see if I like it, to see if it's something that I wanna do more of, but I've been hesitant, you know, at my age even, I've been hesitant to go into something where I would feel um, just totally incompetent. Yet I get that you, um, there's not room for that in your vocabulary. And you just put, I think, put everybody at such ease and with such grace. So I may have to make a statement right here, right now. I'm going to check out one of these classes, y'all. I may just start with an art history class because I don't think I appreciated art history nearly as much when I was a freshman in college, when it was like, we have to take an art history class. Yeah. You know, that's no way to teach art history. I don't think that, you know, you have to take it and you're a freshman and it's your first semester in college. You want me to sit and look at a bunch of slides on a screen, you right. know? So I think that would be really fun to um, have a conversation and, and really get engaged with other people in the community around some of that. Yeah. So thanks for being here and helping us to look to see art in a different way as part of our self-care program, as part of our, um, like I say, it's a, it's a very self-indulgent kind of thing in a good way to, to, to make art, to, um, 
to just immerse ourselves in whatever whatever brings us joy and makes us feel really good. So thanks for talking about it here with me today, Sarah. Hey, no problem. It was a pleasure and I appreciate, I always love talking about art. It makes me happy. And so uh, you giving me the opportunity to do that was uh, wonderful. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. I appreciate I appreciate your whole outlook about outlook on art. It's just very refreshing. And uh, I, I love, I love how you love what you do. So, okay. <laughs> and I want to thank all of you for joining us for the Real Women, Real Purpose talk show live in the On Purpose Woman magazine Facebook page. For a list of the Real Women, Real Purpose talk show topics, you can go to my website, which is www.opwgc.com. It's a newish website. Go check it out. It's got everything there. You go there and you click on the magazine and then you can see all of our class, all of our um, interviews coming up. And if you love this interview and you want to share it with your friends, you can actually share it right here from this page if you're watching this live or watching the replay. But in probably another 48 hours or so, it will be up on our YouTube channel. You can go there. And I really encourage you to go to our YouTube channel. It's the On Purpose Woman Global Community. That's the name of the channel because we've probably got at least 40 plus really great interviews with other women who are out there, real women, living their life on purpose and uh, just giving us all sorts of information and inspiration to go out there and live our own on purpose life. So I wanna thank you again and let you know that next Tuesday I'll be interviewing Mary Knipple, who is a book mentor. We're gonna be talking about, yes, you're a writer and yes, your story matters, which really ties, I think a lot into what we've been talking about today because yes, you're an artist and yes, your vision matters. You know, yes, we can all call ourselves these things because if we're writing, we're a writer. And if we're making art, I say we're an artist. So thank you again, everyone, for watching the Real Women, Real Purpose talk show. I'm Jenny Robertson, and I'll see you again real soon.